Ethereum was built to be a sort of new and improved version of Bitcoin and to do things that Bitcoin couldn't do. The original aim with Ethereum was to create not just a decentralized money, but essentially a decentralized global computer that could do computational problems. Ethereum has its own currency, Ether. The Ether, though, are really there to serve as sort of gas for the computations that are going on on this network of computers that are running Ethereum. Initially, you know, it was meant to be just as a sort of master coin plus a programming language. You know, this sort of form of money that you could do during complete scripting on top of. And initially, the scripting was only even meant to be between two parties. It was, you know, you didn't have this idea of like massively multi-party multi contracts. After that, we started, you know, doing, fig, fig, figuring things out with a programming language. And I realized that, you know, hey, it's actually possible to write a compiler for this. And that's when I started realizing, you know, hey, you can do Namecoin in two lines of code. You can do a sort of decentralized version of Dropbox in like 15 lines, distributed governance, and uh, all these different blockchain-based blockchain -based contract applications and so forth. And uh, one, just one really practical example of that, you know, look at something like file storage. File storage, you know, right now we do, see, you know, people use things like AWS, things like Dropbox, and, you know, various other points, parts of, you know, centralized cloud storage. Um, it's kind of painful for me to call it cloud storage. Really, like clouds are something that just feels inherently decentralized. It almost feels this sort of deceptive metaphor because it sort of implies that it's something that you could just sort of forget about when really, no, it's controlled by somebody and they're giving half your data to the NSA. In general, when you have points of centralization, points of centralization become points of central data collection. And a point of central data collection is something that can get attacked and it can lead to very large data leaks very easily. You know, right now we have data leaks almost everywhere. You know, basically, if you use some online service, you can expect with high probability that anything you do inside of that service will at some point, uh, at some point years from now get leaked and, you know, the world will have access to it. Now, fully decentralized open protocols is uh, one of those uh, kind of one, one other solution that makes, might make more sense. And blockchains are one example. You know, blockchains don't rely on people kind of choosing one particular server. Blockchains actually do rely on, uh, are kind of protocols that work without any one particular centralized interme uh, intermediary being necessary. Right. So the way I define a blockchain is it's a decentralized system that contains some kind of shared memory. And you know, in Bitcoin's case, the shared memory is how many Bitcoins everyone has at some time, but it could be anything. So a good blockchain application is an application that number one needs decentralization and number two needs some concept of shared memory. And you know, the case for decentralization in uh, cryptocurrencies themselves, I think, is fairly clear. But you can actually even go beyond that. Right. You can think about, you know, if you have decentralized um, a cryptocurrency is then you you know you can build many other things on top of them, and there was this interesting idea that um, Nick Szabo came up with about 25 years ago that was called a smart contract, and he made an analogy to a vending machines, right? So what he said was that a vending machine is a device implemented in physical hardware that basically implements the conditions of some kind of an agreement, and the conditions of an of the agreement here are simple. You put two dollars in, water comes out. You do not put two dollars in, water does not come out. If you put, if you do not put two dollars in, but water does come out, then that's bad. And the vending machine is basically an encoding of this set of rules, and that that also comes with you know a mechanism that keeps it at least kind of secure, secure enough for two dollar water bottles. Now with uh, digital assets. You can think about this kind of concept and make and push it much much further because in the digital world, you know, with in the world of cryptography, it's this world where even individuals are capable of basically having to, having cryptographic defenses that are strong enough to even sometimes ward off state level actors. And when you have that kind of security, the possibilities go up, right? So the general notion of a smart contract is that it's like a computer program that directly controls digital assets. 
know, the kind of direct control here is important, right? It's not a computer program that makes a recommendation to a guy about how the guy should control the digital asset. It's a computer program that controls the digital asset. Now, on Ethereum, you can literally send a bunch of Ether into a computer program. And once you've done this, the computer program itself has basically the unilateral ability to control you know, where the money goes. If the computer program sends the money to address A, it goes to address A. If it wants to send it to address B, it goes to address B. And if it doesn't want to send it anywhere at all, then the money just stays there. And you can see this being used in a bunch of applications like insurance, just like any kind of self-executing financial contract. You can reduce counterparty risk in a lot of those kinds of applications by potentially a really huge amount. I mean, you could imagine it being used for even for more complex things. So there is this idea of DAOs, which are like these entire long running entities that hold on to digital assets and bas basically use those digital assets in various ways according to these kind of fairly complex sets of rules. And then you could even imagine, you know, like systems for crowdfunding. So if you think about what Kickstarter does, for example, you know, let's People throw in money. If they've thrown in enough money within 30 days, then the money goes to the developer. And if they, yeah, they do not send in enough money, then everyone gets refunded. And that's like a set of rules that could be replicated in a piece of code. And uh, you have to look at the fundamental advantages. And I think if you want to try and look for practical applications, you have to sort of start from those fundamental advantages and try to see, OK, you know, what kinds of things really benefit from those fundamental advantages. And you know how do we develop products based on them? So with uh, crypt cryptography and crypto economics, what I'm seeing is basically a way of ensuring very very high free entry, but at the same but at the same time still maintaining a higher degree of trust. So one example for you know for decentralized file storage, there's this protocol called Erasure Coding that allows you to take say take a gigabyte file, then split it into 20 chunks of 100 megabytes each such that any 10 of those chunks can be used to reconstruct the original file. So 20 chunks of 100 megabytes, that's 2 gigabytes, split them across 20 computers, any 10 of those can be sort of mathematically combined to get you the original gigabyte back. So it's sort of 2x split, but you know, statistically speaking, unless more than half the network disappears, your chances of losing the file are basically incredibly tiny. So this is one example of you know, decentralization in practice solving the problem of, well, what if this guy has bad quality of service and disappears? The point, I guess, is it's about separating the software developer from the service provider and saying, you know, instead of there being only one provider of a service, which also is the developer, saying, OK, you can develop an application. And then once it's out there, anyone can be on the provider market. Anyone can be on the receiver market. You have high degree of competition. And you have crypto economic security to ensure that the whole thing is trustworthy. Second thing is incentivization. So at the sort of low, low free entry, high barrier to entry side of the spectrum, you don't really need incentivization because you say, OK, well, you have the legal system. And if somebody does something really, really bad, then you can sue them. Or you, know, you can regulate them or whatever. Here, you don't have that because you know, this little guy in his laptop is just not, not worth suing or regulating. And it's just too expensive, too. So instead, you need to have economic incentives. You need to use. You need to have this idea of, hey, let's have this guy put down a security deposit. And if he misbehaves, then we have a protocol which automatically destroys the security deposit and donates it to UNICEF. So that's basically an alternative way of policing, an alternative way of ensuring that these kind of trust issues don't appear. And it solves the problem without introducing these monopoly problems because you still have a market that anyone can participate in. How do these ideas fit into the energy industry, right? So first of all, you have to think about what it is that you're trying to decentralize. So in general, I mean, you have production of energy. And you know, who is producing the energy, whether it's coal, nuclear, solar, wind, you know, it's produced by somebody. And the, the, the producers might be centralized, they might be decentralized. Distribution, so the wires, basically. And I, would, I mean, I would also add to the distribution things like uh, um, energy storage, um, I mean, infrastructure, um, source authentication. So you know, some people care about whether or not their energy is green. People care about whether or not they might care about whether or not their energy is financing any nasty dictators, and also market mechanisms, right? So basically, allocation and incentivization. So these are all things that you might think about, kind of. You, 
being an, uh, areas where decentralization might make sense. So now, obviously, if you're going to replace all of these different systems, you have a scaling issue. You have yes. to figure out, especially with a centralized mechanism like that, even just to handle visas throughput, let alone every imaginable smart contract, that's not going to work if everyone's running a copy of every com program on their computer. Yeah, totally. So, you know, if you look at like uh, just the raw numbers of blockchains today, Bitcoin is currently processing some a, a bit less than three transactions a second, and if it goes close to four, then it's uh, already at peak capacity. Ethereum, right? You know, over the last few days, it's been doing about five a second, and if it goes above six, then it's also at peak capacity. So, on the other hand, you know, Uber on average 12 rides a second, PayPal several hundred, Visa several thousand, major stock exchanges tens of thousands, and if you want to go up to IoT, then you're talking hundreds of thousands. And if you're, you want to go up to non-financial applications, so like for example, there's a platform called Leroy, which is basically just Twitter on the blockchain, then you know, you're talking also about hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. So. You know, there is a kind of gap from here to there. And I think right now there already is really a lot of institutional hype in the space and just public hype. So when you have, you know, like Vladimir Putin having, you know, knowing what blockchains and Ethereum are and Paris Hilton going out promoting ICOs on Twitter, you know, that's, that, that's peak hype. But the reason, I think a large part of the reason why a lot of this hasn't materialized into action yet is precisely because of some of these technical obstacles that make blockchains you know, work okay for some niche use cases, but not really work, work well for mainstream use. Now, you know, our team is working very hard on various kinds of scalability solutions. So you hear about buzzwords like plasma, sharding, state channels, write-in, you know, like all uh, there's you know, various newer ones like Perun. Um, so, you know, if you, you know, you, all of these are various different ideas that actually do try to kind of break through this fundamental barrier, right? That try to either create blockchains that still maintain a large amount of security without requiring everyone to literally process everything, right? So if you think about it, like one extreme is one guy processes everything, which is today's world. The other extreme is everyone processes everything. Well, what if you can get like square root of everyone? So like maybe 500 people processing each transaction, you still get enough decentralization and security for everything you need, but suddenly it's, you know, with, within, uh, it's efficient enough that you know it actually works for for stuff in the real world, and the the other kinds of strategies are strategies that try to use the blockchain in a uh, kind of more intelligently. The way that like traditional pol uh, political just economic powers are going to respond to all of this is like definitely going to be a bi uh, I, I think a big part of the story over the next few years. Like if you in. It is, you know, ultimately it really does disrupt traditional power structures. And, you know, whether it's Washington, you, you know, in New York or Silicon Valley, you know, you know it's, it really does, you know, pose, like, pose serious challenges to the way that things are, are, are working now. But you know, on the other hand, it's one of the things we've, re we've learned actually is that a lot of the people even inside these power structures seem, uh, you know, not, not all of them, but at least some of them seem quite friendly to, you know, these, like, uh, these ideas of disruption. You know, like there are definitely in, are plenty of, you know, JP Morgan employees who are really excited about the possibilities of, you know, like blockchain technology. And, you know, like it's, you know, the fact that you work for a large company or that you work for a government, you know, doesn't mean, you know, doesn't mean that you're a hopelessly boring suit, right? There are serious issues like, you know, the fact is that right you know, proof of work is nice and elegant, but, you know, it costs six, it costs six hundred million dollars a year and it costs another five cents for every transaction. And, you know, the fact is eventually companies are going to advance, regulators are going to get off their butts and, and, you know, start working with them to make it happen. And at some point there's going to come a time when financial institu you know the the traditional financial system is going is, is going to be able to do all of the stuff that existing cryptocurrency can do for for a cheaper cost and at that point you know the decentralized part's just going to fall away i think in order for decentralized technology to stay competitive i think you know it, it has to scale and the costs have to go way down and uh, you need practical applications. You need people to be actually using it because, you know, not just because the ideologic we really care about, you know, decentralization, but because, hey, here's the technology, it solves the problem that I have.
I think the interesting thing with like things like you know Bitcoin and you know Litecoin and so forth is that just generally cryptocurrencies is that even though or even if you assume that nobody uses them for transactions and as you can actually come up with an economic model where they retain value and in the very long term their value actually grows at roughly the same rate as you know world GDP per capita or world GDP and you know, people just use them as you know a portion of their of their investment portfolio, even though it's uh, not they don't kind of have any real world use case. And the reason is that basically it's this kind of self reinforcing equilibrium argument that if people see that this asset class, you know, number one goes up roughly with world GDP in the long term, and number two, you know, goes sort of has short term ups and downs. On a schedule that's uh, dis, you know kind of disconnected from the way the schedule on which uh, stocks go up and down, then it'll just become a natural financial strategy to kind of diversify some portion of your of your funds into that in order to re basically reduce risk and kind of protect yourself for yourself from market shocks to some degree. And so, if people follow that strategy, then over time people will keep putting more and more of their money in it, into it as world GDP increases, and so. The, you know the prophecy will become kind of self-fulfilling in the long term so theoretically basically even you know the you know these things could actually become you know a part of the war of uh, how the world stores its value now there's a question of whether or not that's good or bad for society i think that i mean first of all a lot of the bad for society could be mitigated if the basic proof of work got eliminated and replaced with proof of stake because you know, proof, proof of work is, you know, hugely wasteful and environmentally unfriendly in the way the proof of stake isn't. The really, really nice thing about the space right now is just so young that, you know, people like me can actually get to the point where, actually, where we're actually making significant contributions. You know, if you look at spaces like, you know, standard computer science, programming language theory, math, you know, you need to go through 10 years of old stuff before you even even have enough information in order to be at the forefront where you can actually make contributions. And here it's just such a new industry and there's so much potential that I, you know, I'd like to see, you know, hopefully see a lot, a lot more people just thinking about all this.